sin of pride. Today I want to talk to you about this issue in the Bible, and we're going to see what the Bible has to say about pride. And I'm going to tell you right up front, um, pride is a word that you should remove from your vocabulary if you're a Christian, unless it's in condemnation. Um, you'll not find any references in your King James Bible to pride being a good thing, or proud, you know. Every time you see the word pride or proud or prideful, it's always negative. So you should try and get that thing out of your uh, vocabulary. A good replacement would be, I'm well pleased. You know, you don't say, I'm proud of this. You say, I'm well pleased with this. Or the Lord has blessed me with such and such. Okay? But how do you define pride? Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, Pride. Inordinate self-esteem and unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishments, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt of others. Okay? And then it goes down through a bunch of different examples there, which we're not going to talk about because I'm going to be covering a lot of these scriptures. But the second one there is insolence, rude treatment of others, insolent exaltation. Okay, so what do you have there with pride? You have somebody that thinks that they're better than other people. Somebody that says, well, I make lots more money than that person over there. Or, I, I know the Bible better than that person over there. Or, whatever. You think that you're better than other people. And, you know, some people might be. You know, some of these prideful people might actually be better than someone else in some other area or whatever. But the point is, as a Christian, a Christian trait, you should be humble, not prideful. If God has done things through you and with you and f for you, and you know, if God's done things with you, you should be humble about that. Okay? You should not be proud. You should not go around boasting yourself and, and you know, and, and I got to say this too, you know, because there's a thing people will say, you should never be rude as a Christian. Well, Brethren, you're going to come off as being rude sometimes when you speak absolute truth. All right? You should speak it in love. I understand that. You should be kind, you know, and, and considerate of other people's feelings, not wanting to be called strife or contention. I understand that. But there's a sense in which you're never going to be right with everybody. Okay? There's a sense in which no matter what you do, no matter how nice you are, kind you are, whatever, people are still going to consider you to be rude. All right? So watch out for that thing there of, oh, you know, you shouldn't be rude in things as a Christian. But if your rudeness comes from you being prideful, then yeah, it's a sin. All right? If you are very rude and you're very arrogant because you look down your nose at people and you're like, oh, well, <laughs> you're not as educated as I am or, you know, you're not as rich or as wealthy as I am or whatever, then that's sin. That's sinful pride. Now, what was the first act of pride in the Bible? Go to Genesis chapter 3. If you know your King James Bible, then you probably know where I'm going with this thing. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Okay, it says here, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God never said that, you, that they weren't allowed to touch it. Okay? Eve added to the word of God. First of all, you have Satan coming and putting doubt into her mind, saying, Yea, hath God said. And then she adds to the word of God. You know why you do that? You know why people add to the word of God? Because they're proud. They're too prideful to humble themselves and say, I submit myself to this book that's 402 years old. They don't like that. You know, it looks makes you look bad. It makes you look stupid. Oh, you're one of those King James only people. You know, uh, yeah, I am actually. King James Bible believer. But continuing here, verse 4, And the woman said unto this, I'm sorry, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So he denies God's word there. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, oh boy, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband 
with her, and he did eat. Now you read back there, I think it's in 1 Timothy, it says Adam was not deceived. The reason Adam ate of the tree was because he realized that his wife now was under the death penalty of God. So he said, I don't want my wife to die and me not die with her. So Adam took of the fruit knowing what she had done. Okay, But you see there, why did she take of the fruit? Because of pride. Because she was lifted up, her ego was lifted up. Satan said, you can be like God. You can be as a God, knowing good and evil. You can be wise. Don't you want to be wise? PhD, THD, THM, doctor, you know. See? And what are most of those people? These guys that go around saying, I'm Dr. So-and-so, you know, Dr. Smarty Pants, you know. And uh, what are they? They're proud. Very, very, very prideful. And I'm going to show you this in this study. That's a very, very bad thing. If you want to be used of God, you cannot have pride in your life. You can't do it. Okay? You say, well, can I have pride in the things that, you know, of the Lord and things? That's not the word to use. Okay? Pride has a very negative connotation to it in your King James Bible. You need to avoid it. Leviticus chapter 26. We'll go there next. Next. And we'll actually see the very first time that pride shows up in your King James Bible. We saw what pride looks like there with Eve. But now we're actually going to see here Leviticus chapter 26 verse 14 is where we'll start. And you can read, we're not going to read all these verses, but if you go down through, through verse 14 through verse 43, you'll see a good description of a nation that God is against and that God judges. And you'll see why God judges them. But we're going to read here just a few verses, verses 14 through 20. It says here, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, see again, there's that problem with the Word of God, submitting yourself to the authority of God's Word. See, you know, lowering your pride, and coming down and saying, God, I'll submit to you. A lot of people don't want to do that. That's why they call themselves atheists. Most people who are atheists, you know, in America, I know that there are people in other countries that it's atheistic, you know, communism that's taught there, and they've never actually heard about the Bible. And many people like that, they hear about the Bible, they study the Bible for the first time, and they say, I need to be saved. I know that there's a God, I know this is His book. You know? But most people in the, in the America, or the UK, or whatever, that the English-speaking world, most of those people that claim to be atheists, they're doing it because they're convicted by this book. They don't want to know uh, that there's a book out there that says you're a sinner and you're going to hell. That's why a lot of those people reject the Word of God. But continuing here, verse 15, And if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. Hmm. You know the root cause of this whole terrorism problem? You know why? Because people don't want to, to obey and submit to the Word of God. That's why. And is the terrorist problem real? Yeah, it is. There are terrorists, but most of them are in suits and ties and, and work in political offices. But it says here, I, even appoint, I will even appoint over you terror, cons consumption and the burning egg, or ague, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. You'll be overtaxed, in other words, basically. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will uh, make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain. Uh, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Now notice there in verse 19, I will break the pride of your power. It was very interesting after 9-11, I remember seeing all these vehicles driving around and these people had bumper stickers that said, the power of pride. Little American flag, you know, you can see it here. I have a picture of it up. The power of pride. 
And I thought, that is about the most stupid thing that there ever was. You know, here comes the, te the terrorists, you know, they're coming in, they're going to attack again, and you say, hey, whoa, hold on. I have pride. Don't you attack me, I have the power of pride. And the terrorist goes, oh, oh I didn't realize you had pride. Oh, I, I, okay, I, I'll leave you alone. Please don't hurt me with your pride. <laughs> what is the power of pride? What does that do? That shows ignorance. How about this one? Pride equals power. Isn't that a nice little button? Don't you just want to put that thing on your lapel? You know? And, you know, have this nice little rainbow thing, you know? And, you know, I'm going to be a Christian and I like to have little rainbows around me and things like that. And, you know, I watch out for Christians that have rainbow motifs and things on their channels and websites and stuff like that. The rainbow is God's symbol of judgment. Okay, It's his symbol of a covenant that he made there with, with Noah that he's not going to again destroy the earth by a flood. Um, and so the Sodomites come and they say, oh, we'll use the rainbow as our symbol. You know, that's pretty bad. But the fact of the matter is, America is filled with pride, and this nation is about to be broken by God. I've been saying it for a long time, and you say, well, you've been saying it, and, you know, it hasn't happened yet. Oh, actually, yes, it has. You see, there's a quick destruction, and then there's a slow, gradual downward spiral and that's what America is right now you know more and more people are losing their jobs more and more people their health is falling apart um, people are having their their finances depleted uh, all kinds of problems why God's wrath is on this nation yeah we can still preach the word I, I, I appreciate that you know I'm glad for that we can still get on the internet we can still you know put out videos we can still do a lot of things for the Lord but God's breaking this country. And no country ever deserved it like America does. Turn next to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to see another example of pride. We're not going to be covering all the uh, references to pride in your King James Bible. You can do that sometime on your own. But uh, just going to hit a couple of them here. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 28. Now, if you know the, st the story here, basically you have this guy named Goliath. He's this giant, and he was a real giant, by the way. Uh, he wasn't just um, slightly taller than the other people and things. No, this guy was an a offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. It was going on before the flood. It was going on after the flood. Okay, this guy was a part angel, part man. All right, listen to the angel's sermon if you want more on that. Uh, that is what the Bible teaches. They, the sons of God are not the sons of Seth or something like this, something ridiculous. Okay, They were creating huge giants as a result of the fact that they're supernatural beings mingling with flesh. But uh, sounds crazy, but then again, the Bible is a crazy book. But you have this giant there, and he's defying the armies of Israel, and everybody's too chicken to do anything about it. So what happens? David who later becomes King David, comes down to the battlefield, and he says, I can beat this guy out there, this Goliath. You know, just a young man, you know, I can beat this guy out there. And here's what happens, verse 28. It says here, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride... And the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Okay, so his older brother's saying, You prideful little punk. What do you think you're doing coming down here? Oh, yeah, you're going to slay the giant. Oh, boy, yeah, yeah, you little proud little, little jerk, you know. And David says, Hey, what have I done? You know, isn't there a cause here? In other words, why am I the only one that's saying this? All you big, brave, bad guys out here, haven't, well, how come you haven't taken care of him yet? You know? It's kind of funny. It reminds me a lot, a lot of the brethren here on YouTube, you know, 
they'll put out messages that these guys, these, a lot of the big name, you know, pastors out there, they wouldn't touch some of the controversial issues that my brothers in Christ talk about, you know. Why? You know, well, because they're part of big building systems and they have paychecks and everything else that they have to worry about, you know. Just kind of an interesting little jab I had to put in there. But uh, look down at verse 45. David, of course, does go to battle with Goliath. But uh, it says here, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now let me just stop there before we continue. Notice, if David really truly was prideful, like his older brother said, David would have come and he would have said, Hey, you up there, I bet you I can beat you. I mean, after all, I lift weights and things, and I, I'm really in good shape. And I mean, I have this really nice sword I just got down at the local sword shop. And I, I mean, I, I'm very good with this sword. And after all, I mean, I'm really something else. And I'm, I'm going to teach you a lesson. But he didn't do that. He said, I'm come from the God of Israel. The Lord is going to deliver you into my hands. Okay? He gives God the glory. See, that's not pride. And when you as a Christian, when the lost world says, oh, you think you're so smart, you think you're going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell, you say, yes, I am going to heaven, and if you're not saved, you're going to hell. You know why? Not because I'm a good person, not because I've done something of my own merit, but because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross to pay for my sins, his death, his burial, his resurrection, to justify me and give me an eternal inheritance in heaven. I can't boast of anything. It's all Jesus Christ and what He did for me. See? See, that's not pride. Now, if I said, well, of course I'm going to heaven. I'm a highly educated, uh, very intelligent person. And I'm very, very good. I mean, I've, I'm not a drunkard. I'm not a murderer. I'm, I'm a very, very smart, wonderful, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's pride. But boasting in what Jesus Christ has done... That's not pride. And giving glory and honor to the Lord, that's not pride. But let's continue here. What happens to Goliath? Verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Ran toward the army of the enemy. Boy, you got to get a hold of that one. That's pretty neat. In other words, he was offensive in his warfare. He didn't wait for the enemy to come to him by building a building and inviting the lost to it. He went out against the army of the Philistines. Hmm. But, uh, verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Gotta love that. You know, here's this giant, and he's got all these weapons and everything else, and David's there and he's got the little piece of leather, a little, you know, string of leather and a little, you know, part in the middle there that you put the stone in, you sling it around and you, <laughs> you know, boom, right into the head, down he goes. You know, pretty amazing. But uh, verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. I heard a guy say the one time jokingly, he said, that's how you get a head in life. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, what happened there? Well, David gave God the glory. And then he said, okay, now I put my faith in the Lord, what he's going to do. He's going to slay you, and I'm going to give God the glory. 
and he ran towards the army. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are into soul winning ministry, you know, you should give God glory for the thing. And a lot of that soul winning stuff gets kind of carnal. You know, you read a lot of these old things. We had, you know, 40,000 saved in, in a day, you know, and all this stuff. Preached to millions of people, you know, and blah, blah, blah. You know, I know it's in the book of Acts. I know that it records how many people got saved. But the whole thing is, it's it's like the Lord recording it. It's not really that Peter's going around saying, we had 3,000 people saved on the day of Pentecost. Praise God, you know. No, I mean, that stuff can get kind of carnal. I mean, if you're putting out tracks and things like that, you know what I would do? Don't even count them, you know. I mean, I, I, I've done this stuff. I mean, I, you know, I'm just giving you some instruction in righteousness. Just hand them out. You know, give them the people, lay them out, whatever, and let the Lord give the increase. You know, you don't have to prove that you're some militant soul winner out there by counting the number of conversions that you've had and whatever else. Give God the glory. You go out, run into the enemy there, run into the enemy territory, go into the city, go into the, you know, wherever, where the Lord tells you to go out and put out tracts, go witness to people, go out there and give God the glory for it. Okay, that's what you can learn from that story there. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 32. We'll go there next. Second Chronicles 32. I failed to mention here at the beginning of this, um, we're in here inside again today because it's been raining off and on. It's, the sun was out there just a minute ago just looking outside. But uh, it just keeps on raining, so didn't want to go out and risk the chance of getting my Bible wet. I have a waterproof King James Bible, New Testament, which wouldn't have helped me today because we're in the Old Testament a lot. But I don't have waterproof notes, so uh, that wouldn't quite work. Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 24 says here, In those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign, and Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. See the pride there? Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Notice that. It wasn't that God said, okay, then I'll just never punish Jerusalem. You know, I'll never punish Judah and Jerusalem because you humbled yourself and I, you know, you turned from your wickedness and things, so I'm never going to punish. No, he just simply said, I'm not going to punish in your days, Hezekiah. Because of the pride that he had, he actually humbled himself. And you know, God has spared America for so long because there's a lot of Bible-believing Christians here and because we have humbled ourselves. And yeah, we're seeing judgment. Yeah, we're seeing things starting to fall apart. America's starting to be broken. But the way you preserve it is by humbling yourself. Not by being prideful. Not by going around strutting your stuff and saying, Oh, yeah, I have constitutional rights. Bless God, I'm a patriot. And all this other stuff. That doesn't do it. That doesn't cut it with the Lord. The Lord is not interested in the United States Constitution. He's not interested in the Bill of Rights or anything else. Okay? The Lord is interested in a broken and a contrite spirit. He's interested in humility. Which we're going to see here as we continue. Job chapter 41. Job 41 verse 1. Cover this uh, this past week in the study on smoking and uh, we talked about Leviathan, Leviathan being a type of Satan. Job 41 verse 1, to get in the context here, uh, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook or to his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Okay, so Leviathan is basically given as a fire-breathing dragon in this chapter. You can read about that. All right, but uh, jump down to verse 15. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. So you have this dragon 
basically, and his scales are so close together, you're not going to get an arrow in there, you're not going to get a sword or a spear in there. So how does that make that this creature Leviathan feel? Makes him feel strong, makes him feel like he's invincible, which leads to pride. And you know, when you start to have that attitude in this life, when you find somebody that has that attitude, that knows everything, and they are in good physical shape, and they start to feel like they're invincible, you know what it leads to? Pride. When you have somebody who's been through some sickness, and they've been through some hard times, and they know what it's like to suffer a little bit, you'll find somebody who's humble. Humility. Which is kind of a rough thing as a Christian, because that means that quite oftentimes God's going to let you be going through some sickness. Quite often times God's going to let you suffer a little bit to keep you humble. See? Eww. It's rough, isn't it? God doesn't want you feeling invincible down here because then you don't give Him glory. You start to take pride for yourself and think that you're really somebody. You know? But look down to verse 33. Job chapter 41, verse 33. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Hmm. That's interesting. So his children have pride. Let's take a look at Satan's children, who they are. John chapter 8. Turn to your New Testament. John chapter 8. John 8, verses 43 through 47. And you won't have to be on YouTube very long. If you make videos, you'll discover some of these children. There's a lot of them on YouTube. Okay. You'll see them in the comments on these videos. Uh, sometimes I don't approve them because they're just putting links into videos that attack me or, or uh, that it will lead people astray or, or they'll use profanity and things. So a lot of times I don't, you know, approve their comments. Uh, most comments I try to approve, you know, if they're not too ridiculous. But uh, John chapter 8 verses 43 through 47 says, Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil. Remember it said he's a king over all the children of pride? See? And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Now look at this one. He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, here's a very important thing to understand. I fully understand that there are people out there that for some reason or another they've fallen for these new versions. I understand that. I believe that you can be saved and use a new version. All right? Somebody gets saved, they're genuinely saved, they hear the gospel, whatever, and they go out to a, a you know, Christian bookstore and they say, I'm looking for a Bible. Somebody sells them a new version. Okay? That's fine. But I believe that if the Spirit of Truth is there, he that is of God heareth God's words. When somebody who is genuinely converted, when they hear this book right here, it won't seem like, oh, I hate that book. It might seem strange at first. It might seem kind of like, huh, I kind of like the way that sounded, but boy, that seems kind of hard. But as you study it more and more and more, it becomes easier and easier, and the Lord shows you the interpretation of it. But when you get these people and they say, I'm a Christian, but I hate and despise the King James Bible. I'm sorry, I don't believe that those people are saved. They're not saved. Why? He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. He's talking to the children of the devil. And by the way, he was talking to religious people there. He wasn't talking to a bunch of atheists. Practicing atheists, maybe, but he was talking to the religious men of his day, the scribes, the scholars, you know, the people who tell you that the better rendering would be here and the King James translators didn't really know what they were doing and, and didn't know what they were talking about and things. See, those are those people. 
that's the crowd. You know what, what most quote-unquote Bible scholarship is today? This higher textual criticism, and I mean of the Alexandrian school of thought, you know what it is? It's based on pride. It's exactly what it is. Why? They don't want to believe in any Bible out there. People say, well, Brian, you attack the new versions. Yeah, and I offer you a perfect replacement. See, I don't say the King James isn't no good, the NIV is no good, the ESV is no good. None of them are perfect. Come to me because I'm a Greek and Hebrew scholar. I don't say that. I say none of the new versions are good, but go to the King James Bible and you'll have God's perfect word for you if you speak English. That's what I say. You don't need me to interpret the book for you. I can preach to you, I can teach you the Word of God, but when it comes right down to it, this is all you need right here, the King James Bible. That's all you need. See? And if you're of God, you'll hear God's words. You'll understand that I'm telling you the truth. And if you see I make a mistake, you go, well, you know, Brother Brian made a mistake there, but, you know, he's right on these other areas there. I'll follow him there and not where he made a mistake. Fine, praise the Lord, you know? But you see, right there is the, the test. And when you get these people that don't believe in any Bible out there, and they're just, you know, telling you that the, this rendering should be this, and now the Greek word there should be blah, blah, blah. blah. They're proud. You know? The Bible talks about back there in 1 Timothy chapter 6 about people being proud, knowing nothing, you know, doting about questions and strifes of words. Yeah. That's what those people are. Watch out for that. Okay. Now turn in your Bible back to Psalm 10. Psalm 10. We're going to start here in uh, verse 1. Read down to verse 8. It says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight, as for all his enemies he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Don't you love that? You say, America's going to be destroyed. A lot of these lost people are like, oh, come on. I've been hearing that for years. I'll never be in adversity. It's never going to get that bad. We're never going to have an economic collapse. All this end time stuff, it's not going to happen. Come on. I'll never be in adversity. There they're being described. Verse 7, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages, in the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. It's interesting because these corrupt people, not only do they want to rip other you know, rich people off, but they specifically go after the poor. That's the, one of the marks of a really bad society when people are trying to take advantage even of the poor. But uh, you see the thing there again of pride. Pride being a very bad thing. Um, turn next to Psalm 31. Psalm 31, uh, verse 19. Okay, it says here, O oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. I thought that was kind of interesting, as you know, like the charismatics, the strife of tongues there. <laughs> but it's interesting there. When you fear God, when you're doing the work of the Lord, there's often times the Lord will hide you. I've seen that thing happen. You know, you're doing the work of the Lord and, you know, you're out there putting out tracks or you're, you're witnessing or whatever. Many times, the Lord will actually hide you. 
and it'll enable you to go into places and put those tracks down and you get out of there unscathed, untouched. You know, very interesting. But there it says about, you know, he'll, he'll uh, hide you in the, in the secret presence from the pride of man. You know, another interesting reference there to pride. Uh, very, uh, another thing here, James 4, chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humble. Okay? Uh, 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So you see there, you say, well, brother, I, I have some issues with pride. I, I just uh, really, I have some, you know, things I'm very proud of, and I, I have a hard time humbling myself. Okay, then God's going to resist you. It's just as simple as that. You have to humble yourself. Okay? You should be thinking of other people as better than yourselves. When you're going around thinking that you're really somebody, God's not going to use you. Okay, you have to take a humble position in life. It's just the way it is. Psalm 59, verse 12. Psalm 59, verse 12. It says here, For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Hmm. Very interesting because quite oftentimes the wicked will lie and curse against a humble Christian. They'll lie about you. They'll say things that you are saying that you never said. And they'll, they'll backstab you and gossip about you and do all sorts of things. And you know what's going to happen? God will take them in their pride. Very interesting. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. It says here, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. You know, one of the favorite little cliches that people like to use now is, quit hating on people, or, or why do you have such hate? Well, as a Christian, you're supposed to hate evil things. And it's kind of funny, too, because there's nobody out there that can truly say that they have no hate in their lives. You know, I just love everything. No, you don't. Hey, do you hate the flu virus? Well, if you have any sense, you do. You know, do you hate poverty? Do you hate sickness? Do you hate uh, having no food? Um, do you hate being out in zero degree temperatures uh, with no coat? <laughs> you know, see, there are many things that you hate. You're to love good things, hate evil things. That's just common sense. People that tell that you, you that you're not to have any hatred in your life, they're mentally sick. Okay? And it's, ve it's very funny, too, because all these people that say about, you shouldn't hate, you shouldn't hate, you should have tolerance and things like that, they hate you as a Bible believer. And they like to, to silence you, you know, and, and keep, you, keep your mouth shut, you know. Very interesting, you know, they, they will not tolerate intolerance kind of thing, you know. Or uh, another little funny thing that they could probably say is, we hate hate crimes. You know, do you hate hate crimes? <laughs> See, th this whole politically correct movement is to get you away from the Word of God. It's to put people down and say, how dare you have beliefs in the Word of God? But it's interesting there, one of the words it says about the froward mouth. Froward, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, says, perverse, that is, turning from with aversion or reluctance, not willing to yield or comply with what is required, unyielding, ungovernable, refractory, disobedient, peevish, as a froward child. Okay? So the froward mouth there is basically a mouth of somebody who's completely disobedient. And, you know, oftentimes they'll take glory in their shame. 
Got this little fly flying around me right now. I apologize for that. I'm not waving to anybody on the film here. You know, I'm just trying to get this for this stinking fly. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 11, verses 1 through 3. And here's another one that's a, a good kick, you know, against some of the brethren, and a, a good kick to all of us, really. Proverbs 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Hmm, a false balance is abomination to the Lord. You say, well, what's that about? Well, you know, if you go back far enough into history, you would have them, say, a farmer coming in with grain, and he goes and he, he puts it to, you know, to weigh it or whatever, or let's see how much you have, and uh, we'll, we'll weigh out uh, the money that we can give to you. you know, so they put some gold coins on there. The only thing is that they've reworked their scale to give a false weight. So when they should have earned 10 pounds of gold, we'll say, or 10 ounces of gold. We'll say 10 ounces of gold, the scale only says that they're owed 8 ounces of gold. You say, well, we don't really have anything like that in the modern times, do we? Uh, well, yeah, actually we do. Uh, kind of like when you go to sell a vehicle, or when you go to sell something, and a person comes and says, is there any problems with this vehicle? No, 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 I runs great. Uh, in the back of your mind, you're saying, boy, I hope they don't ask me about that exhaust because I know there's a leak in it and it does use a lot of oil and things like that but uh, boy I'm gonna try to sell it to them without them finding that stuff out you see that's not having integrity as a Christian and I know it's real tempting you know when you get a junker or some kind of vehicle or some kind of thing that you need to get rid of it's been a problem for you and you want to sell it like it's never been a problem but see what is that it's very similar to an unjust weight. And it's very, very difficult when you get somebody coming and you say, well, I'll tell you right now, um, this vehicle is going to have to be a fixer-upper because it has an exhaust leak. I'll show you where it's at. It's right down under there. See it? And uh, it does use oil. And um, the radio doesn't always work. You know, I don't know. There might be a wiring problem in there and things like that. But you know what I've seen sometimes? I've seen when you do that, and the person says, is there anything else? And you say, I, I really don't, I don't know of anything else. I can't guarantee anything on this vehicle. It has to be sold as is. I, I just want to be as honest as I can. You know, a lot of times that'll sell the vehicle better than you trying to cover it up. I've seen that thing. I've seen it. People, why? Because people can tell that you have integrity. That you're being honest with them. See? That's how we are supposed to live our lives as Christians. We're not supposed to be prideful, boastful, covering things up in false weights and things like that. We're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be honest. Lower your pride. Okay? That's what we're supposed to do. Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13 verse 10. Proverbs 13, verse 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Hmm. Very similar to the verses we just read back there in chapter 10. But by pride, only by pride cometh contention. You see, there's no contention when you're a humble person. All right? Yeah, they can mock you, they can make fun of you, whatever else. But, you know, just, okay, whatever. See ya. But you see, when you're prideful and you're, and you're arrogant, you're going to argue with people, which leads to contention. You know what the best thing to do as a Christian is? When somebody's pushing pride towards you, and you see, I can't get anywhere with this person, just say, okay, see ya.
and walk away. Only by pride cometh contention. It takes two people to have an argument. If they want to argue with you, I'm sorry, I don't have time for that. See ya. I don't need to boast myself. And they go, oh, you coward. Look at you, you you're a little old sissy. Oh, you're a coward, you chicken. Buck, 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 buck. And your pride goes, how dare they speak that way of me. I'm going to go back there and I'm going to tell that person. I'm going to get right in their face. I'm going to say, hey, you, you, yeah, you, there, you know. See, what is that? Pride. You don't need to answer everybody. Hey, we're all going to stand before God someday. It'll all work out. All of it. Every man shall give account of himself to God. Whether at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. Everybody's going to answer to God at some point in time. And he'll sort it all out. You don't have to have your pride get so big that you can't have people put you down. Because brethren, if you're a Christian, you're going to be put down by this lost world. This lost world is going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. And if you're a prideful person, you're not going to be able to take it. It's just as simple as that. You're going to have to have people say nasty things to you and you just go, sorry about that. I'm praying for you. Walk away. And that's why, another reason why I've actually put almost all my videos to approval, you know, comments by approval only. And if things go really crazy in the future, I might just have to get rid of the comments. I don't know what I'm going to do there yet. Because a lot of my older videos that I had, all comments are approved automatically. I've seen these Christians and they know the truth. And somebody gets on there and they're just trying to, just trying to get them. You know, get their goat, as they say. And I see this, these comment battles. And they'll go on for months at a time. And it's just like the Bible says, in heretic, a man that is in heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. And I've seen Christians, Bible-believing Christians, argue with heretics for months at an end. And they'll put four, five, six comments, you know, these big continued, 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 continued. They'll put these things on. All this contention. Why? Pride. Pride. Hey, Brian, you, you're, you're awfully stupid. You stand for the King James Bible, and I can prove from my Greek professor and blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I got, I got work to do, man. I, you know, I'm busy. I'm too busy for that stuff. Sometimes I'll go in and I'll answer somebody. Somebody has a real genuine question or, or they say something and I'll just be like, okay, I'll answer this person because it'll help other people. But a lot of times I don't have any pride to, to, you know, that I have to protect, a reputation that I have to protect. You want to call me an idiot? You want to call me lost? You want to call me whatever? Okay, go ahead. It's all going to be sorted out in the end. I don't need to worry about it. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. It says here, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Hmm. Now, what did we read at the very beginning of this sermon? We read about Eve. What did she do? She was a foolish woman who plucked down her house with her own hands. There she is in a perfect garden of Eden. She had it made. Everything was wonderful. And what does she do? She's lifted up with pride and she says, I can speak better than God. I am wiser than the Lord. I can add to what the Lord commanded me. She was foolish. She plucked down her house with her hands. But it says there a wise woman will build her house, buildeth her house there. She won't do things to tear down her husband. She won't do things to tear down the home that God has given them. She'll do things to build it up to make it a wonderful place for the Lord. But you see, when there's pride there, see, the wife comes home to her house and it's, it's just not quite as big as the neighbors, you know? And my vehicle isn't, isn't as new as my neighbor. Husband, uh, I think we need to get a bigger place because after all, I mean, what do the ladies in town think of me? 
And I mean, I'm driving this old station wagon or this old whatever. I really need a new Suburban, you know? What's going on? She's got pride and she's plucking her house down. See? I gotta have a nicer dress. I gotta have a mink coat. I gotta have all these things because of my pride. Yeah. And a foolish woman will do that and cause her husband to work harder, which hurts the family more, and causes them to be in debt to the bank, which causes financial strain on the marriage, and pretty soon there's talk of divorce. Happens all the time. Why? Because the foolish woman plucked her own house down with her hands. You know the most blessed thing out there, and the Bible says a virtuous woman, you know, her price is far, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Why? The man goes out and he knows, I can trust my wife at home. I can trust her. I know that she doesn't need more than what we have. She's thankful. She has no pride. She doesn't care if other women look down their noses at her. She doesn't care if the women say, oh, you're not wearing any jewelry. <laughs> she goes, yeah, whatever. You know, don't need any. I got a good husband from the Lord. Hey, you know what, ladies? If you have a saved husband and he works hard to put food on the table and he has a provided a roof over your head, you better thank the Lord. You better be happy for that. And you shouldn't say, I need a bigger house. I need a better car. I need a better this. I need a better that. You're plucking down your house with your own hands. Don't be like Eve. Okay? Be a virtuous woman. Seek to be a virtuous woman. You say, well, my husband's no good. He's not worth shooting. Okay. Well, then pray for him. And encourage him in the things that he does do right. If he's saved, if he's lost, well, then you got to start doing some major praying. But it says there, He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. Do you fear God? Well, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and pride. You need to get a hold of that thing. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. Hey, when you get around people, do you boast about things? Do you try to make yourself look like you're somebody really important? Are you content to just take a humble place? You know, one of the best things that you can do as a Christian, you ready? I'm going to show it to you. Keep your mouth shut. Oh, but I have to tell people, I have to get into conversation. Just shut up. When you're out there in the world and there's conversations and everything else, if you can witness for Jesus Christ, great. Open your mouth. But if it's conversations of the world and boasting about, I caught this fish, brother, when I was up in Alaska this one time, you should have seen the trophy, you know, the moose I shot. I'll tell you what, bigger than anything you've ever seen. Shut up if you're a Christian. Don't get pulled in. Don't let, there it says, the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. Don't let that thing come out of your mouth. Okay? The lips of the wise shall preserve them. Sometimes the best advice is keep your mouth shut. And it'll preserve you. Won't get you into trouble. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 verses uh, 18 through 20. Okay, it says here, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be an humble to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the, divide the spoil with the proud. Yeah. Oh, brother, I got these business deals, you know, and stuff, and you want to be a big-time executive, and you want to make lots of money? You know, let's come on in here, man. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, let me tell you about the kind of money that you can make at this thing. Oh, uh, no, thank you. I'm content with what the Lord's given me. See? Oh, but brother, you can divide the spoil with the proud. No, I'd rather stick with the humble and just be content with such things as I have. See? You're much better off that way. But pride goeth before destruction. So when you see a nation that is talking about gay pride and power of pride and pride, 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 
and they're proud of their sin, you're looking at a nation that's just about ready to fall. And I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to fall before the rapture. I have no idea. I hope that it's after the rapture. Um, but if it doesn't happen until the rapture, I will guarantee you one thing. America will fall after the rapture. When the Holy Spirit and the bodies of Christians is yanked out of here, and for a time the Holy Spirit is not there to restrain the evil, whoo, boy, I praise the Lord that we aren't going to be here for that. <laughs> Without the restraining of the Holy Spirit upon this nation of America, it is going to be a nightmare. Horrible. You say, why? Well, because pride goes before destruction. Turn next to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 23. It says here, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Very true. You know, we read about there in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, um, verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Now what's that talking about? Well, it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, but it's also talking about the millennial kingdom. Isn't it funny that some lowly Christian who's humble in this life comes back and rules and reigns with, reigns with Jesus Christ on the earth for a thousand years? Isn't that incredible? You know, now they look at you and they go, lousy Christian, what a loser. Oh, look at that guy. You know, what are you? You don't live on the, in the rich community or in a, in a mansion or things like that. You don't have any kind of political sway. You're not in the upper crust of society. It's like, no, but I will be one day. I'm going to be a member of the greatest royal family in the universe. And when I come back, to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, I'm going to be high society. I might not look like it right now, but I will be one day. And if you're a Christian, you will be too. Okay? But if, you're, if you have pride now, it's going to bring you low. Alright, you're going to lose rewards. Because your pride is going to keep you from doing the work of the Lord. Your pride is going to keep you from being attacked and mocked for Jesus Christ. See? So you better bring yourself down a few notches. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Next we're going to go to Daniel chapter 4. One of the most powerful men who's ever existed. We're going to read about him here. Daniel chapter 4 verse 28. This is where we're going to start out. It says here, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the first king of the very first one world government, the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold. Okay, This guy was an extremely powerful dictator slash king. I mean, this guy had pretty much the known world at his time under his authority. And if there was any place that wasn't known, you know, they would have been in subjection had they been discovered or whatever. I mean, this, is, this guy controlled everything. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Oh boy. Here he is, this great king, and he's walking around and he's saying, Look at all this kingdom. I've built it with my power, my majesty. It's all me. Look what happens. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Oh, but wait a second there. You see, the Illuminati, they, they, they pick people through you know, the Masonic Lodge and Skull and Bones, and they set things up, and nobody is able to get into power unless the Illuminati says so. Not true. You see, that verse there says, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of 
men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. God sets up kings. God deposes kings. God sets them up. And what happens when you have a man and he's going around and he's saying, I have done this great stuff, me, my, you know, and all this stuff. God says, okay, buddy, your pride needs to be abased. You need to be brought down a few notches. And I'm going to do it. That's what the Lord says. Verse 33, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was, was, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? I love that. I mean, here's a guy, probably the most powerful politician that ever lived on the planet. Maybe outside of King Solomon. King Solomon was pretty powerful. But this man was extremely powerful. And God says, uh, you're going to give me honor and glory? Well, no, it's all, my, it's, it's all on me. I'm the one who has the power and everything. And God says, okay, boom, you're an animal. And there's King Nebuchadnezzar out in the field, you know, you know, like an animal. People walking by the field, and there's old King Nebuchadnezzar out there, old crazy King Nebuchadnezzar, out there rooting around in the ground, you know, eating grass or something. You know, <laughs> what an image. What a thing. And you know, it's very interesting, because I've heard a lot of people say that perhaps King Nebuchadnezzar got saved. We'll continue reading here, and we'll show you why they say that. It says, uh, verse 36, And this, at the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Hmm. Wouldn't that be something to see King Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? There's a pretty good chance that he's going to be there. But what does it take? What did it take for him to get saved? To know that God loves him? No. To have his pride abased. And let me tell you something out there. If you're watching this video and you're not saved, you know what your problem is? You know what keeps you from getting saved? Your pride. What are my friends going to think? What are my coworkers going to think? What are people, my, my, the community here on YouTube or on Facebook or on whatever, what are they going to think? What's wrong with you? You're not willing to humble yourself. God's going to have to base that pride before you can be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God's not interested in prideful men and women coming to Him and saying, Hey, you, you, yeah, you, save me. All right? You're going to save me because I'm going to pray this prayer. I'm not going to change my life. I'm not going to do anything for you. You know, I'm just going to do what I want with my life. You know, you save me. God wants people coming to him in a broken state and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, like the publican that smote upon his breast and said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, you know. And he comes and he's broken before God. Kind of like Nebuchadnezzar here comes like an animal before the Lord. Those are the people that the Lord will, he's, he, that he'll listen to that he's interested in. All right, Not people that come in pride. He's not interested in that. Turn next to Obadiah. Obadiah. They're your minor prophets. Obadiah. There's only one chapter, so chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, says here, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, though thou dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exaltest thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. 
it's kind of funny because you have like in the cities a lot of these rich powerful people will they'll get penthouses you know up in the very tops of the skyscrapers and they like live up there you know and they're like you know you can't even get up to my floor because you know you're not as important as me and I look down on the rest of the world and ha 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 you know uh-huh you know what chance they have of being saved very little you know what it takes for them to go from that high and lofty position and fall down boom <laughs> And I don't mean out of the window, I mean in pride. Had their pride be brought low, humble themselves before the Lord. Most people don't do that. Most people would rather go to hell than to humble themselves and be brought low. Most people are too proud to get saved. Turn next to Mark. These people may say, well, you know, I'm doing my best. I'm trying hard to get to heaven, you know, and and I mean, I just, I think if I let my heart be my guide, you know, I'll I'll be all right. I follow just as long as you follow your heart, you know, just just follow your heart, and and God loves you, and there's so much love in God, and and things, and and He'll just He just loves you, and 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 loves you, and and He He loves you, <laughs> you know. That's the way it is. That's the way most people think. They have too much pride in them to admit to being a sinner. But what does Jesus Christ think about your heart? Mark chapter 7, verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Hmm. Are you proud to be an American? Do you have power of pride? If you do, you're evil. Mm -hmm. And you better get rid of that attitude if you expect to be saved. You better humble yourself before the Lord. You come to Him as a sinner. You don't come in your pride. You don't come and say, Hey, this is the way it's going to be, God. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Humble yourself before the Lord. You better not have power of pride. That's an evil thing that comes from within, and that's what defiles you, too, by the way. 1 Timothy chapter 3. You say, well, that's, you know, for the wicked, for the lost. Well, you know, partly, yeah, Christian can have those same evil things, you know. Just because you saved, or just because you got saved doesn't mean that your flesh got cleaned up. All right, your flesh is capable of sinning. Uh, so you got to watch out for that thing. But here's something that's a, a very specific warning, not just to Christians, but to pastors specifically. Okay, it says here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now look at this, verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. You know, there's one thing that's very important for you as a Christian that you need to understand. And that is, you don't want to get into ministry too quickly. You say, well then you're saying I shouldn't you know, go pass out tracts. No, you should start passing out tracts. You should start to witness immediately after salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, don't expect to know all the very deepest doctrines just right away. It's going to take you some time. And you say, what happens if I go out right away and try to prove that I'm a big shot or something like that, or really try to take on all kinds of big people? Well, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to get lifted up with pride. And then you're going to fall into the condemnation of the devil. Alright? The devil's going to use you. And there's an awful lot of people out there that are novices, preachers that are novices. They haven't taken the time. They say, I started preaching when I was 13 years old. Give me a break. You're a novice. All right? 
you shouldn't be preaching for well into your late 20s, probably even after you're 30. I mean, Jesus Christ waited until he was 30 to start his earthly ministry. Are you better than him? You know? I mean, wait. Don't be a novice. Why? Because if you're a novice and you get out there and you don't know the Bible and you start yelling and screaming and stuff like that to, you know, a lot of these guys have to yell and scream, put on a big charismatic show to make up for their ignorance, for the fact that they don't really know the scriptures. And what happens is they get lifted up with pride. They draw people in because of the modulation of their voice, you see. They're exciting. They're riveting. They're really neat to listen to. They really get the flesh moving. You know, like that. See? And they go, people go, oh, wow, he can really preach the word. No, he can really put on a performance. He doesn't know the word, a lot of these guys. And what happens as a result is they get lifted up with their pride. All these people coming and saying, oh, pastor, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're so great. And then they're not correctable. And they fall into condemnation of the devil. And they're actually used by Satan. God doesn't use them. As a pastor, you have to remain humble. And as a Christian, the older you get, the more humble you will become. Not more prideful, not more proud. Remain humble. That's so important. It's very important. 1 John chapter 2. Last place we're going to turn to today. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 through 19. If you remember that earlier we read there in John chapter 8 about, you know, he that is of God heareth God's words, that ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Remember that as we go through these verses. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 says, I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now here's a very important verse. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See? That loving the world thing is pride. Leads to pride. Very important. Look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, hmm, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Very interesting. Verse 18, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You know, there's a, a thing I saw not too long ago, Kenneth Copeland, you know, and he has this, uh, they were talking about his mansion that he has in Texas, I think it is. And he has his own airport and he has an, an airplane, which is like a 20 some million dollar airplane. And I thought to myself, how stupid. Look at verse 16 there. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Who's going to care about a $20 million jet a hundred years from now? Nobody. What's that $20 million jet going to look like in a hundred years? Rusted pile of junk. Maybe it'll be sitting in an aviation museum someplace, and they'll say, people used to actually fly in them things? Actually, you know, Honestly, everything's going to be wiped out, you know, in the time of Jacob's trouble and we'll be in the Millennial Kingdom. We won't care about airplanes. But the point is, my point I'm trying to make is, you know, what was highly esteemed a hundred years ago, what is it today? Rusted junk? You know? I heard of a house, a real big historic house in this area, you know, and, and it was just, I mean, just gigantic. Huge, big mansion. I mean... Huge, big place. I, I forget how many bedrooms it had, like 20-some bedrooms or something like this. I mean, just an enormous old mansion. Things falling apart. It took them years just to fix the, the leaks in the roof. But I bet it was something in its day. Boy, I bet you those people that lived there, I bet you they had some real pride. 
Oh, you live at the such and such manor. Oh, 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 you yeah. know. You're the governor and his wife. Oh. What's their house now? Old run-down place that the owners are just trying to keep it going, trying to keep it from falling in. Mm -hmm. You better not set your affection on things down here on this earth. Because everything down here is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Big word there. You know, what is that? The law of entropy. Everything rots. Everything gets worse with time. See? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, brother, I'm, I can't agree with you because I'm working hard, and pretty soon I'm going to have enough money saved up to buy a Corvette. And you know what happens? You go in there and you pay whatever, I don't even know what they are now, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for a Corvette. You drive it off the lot, drive it down a mile down the road, say, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. I'm going to go back to the dealership, get my money back. You pull it back into the dealership and you say, I want my money back for this brand new Corvette. They'll say, uh, it's not brand new. Well, it only has two miles on it, one mile down the road, one mile back to the dealership. They say, yeah, but it's used. We can only give you 40000 for it. I lost that much money? Mm-hmm. You keep it a few more years, you'll lose even more. You know? Now maybe you know, they'd give you more than 40000 but my whole point is, anything that you get on this earth, you buy it, it will depreciate in value. You say, what about a house? You know, you buy real estate, it gets it appreciates. Yeah, because you're constantly putting money into it. You know? Whatever you do in this life, brother, sister, it's going downhill. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ, only when you submit to this book, only what you do what this book tells you to do, that's the only thing that's going to make it into eternity. The only thing. And if you get caught up by the pride of life, if you look out there at this world and you say, I'd like to serve the Lord with my life, but, uh, boy, I just... I'm worried about my career because if I stay with my career and if I work really, really, really hard, I'll have a good retirement someday and I'll be able to have all the money and all the things and, and everything else. Let's just say that you do that, okay? Let's say you live for 90 years, 100 years, and you work for 40 or 50 or 60 years and you save up and you have retirement and you everything else and you have a beautiful home that's paid for and you're able to go to a nice nursing home and you have nice vehicles and you have everything that you want in this life. Most people don't have that. But if you have all of that stuff, what's it going to matter in eternity if you never took time out to serve Jesus Christ? What's it going to matter? It's not going to mean anything. You say, but I had the pride of life. I had lots of good things in this world. I had lots of good riches. Yeah, and now there's somebody else's. And let me speak to the Christians that are alive right now. Okay? Think about where you're at prophetically. Hey, you know something? One of these days, you're going to hear a voice that says, Come up hither. And you're going to leave. And all the things in your home are going to be the property of somebody else. Oh, but brother, I don't want to live in a in a little shack someplace, or I don't want to I don't want to sacrifice my career. I, I mean, because I'm I'm really working hard for my retirement. You better think about that. Um, I don't think most people are going to ever see retirement. I think the Lord's going to come back, and when that time comes, everything is left behind. If the rapture happens within the next couple of minutes here. Somebody's going to come into this building here and they're going to find this shirt right here. They're going to find my wedding ring. They're going to find this Bible laying there. My glasses, my shoes, the keys to my vehicle. They're going to find it all. And you know what I'm going to be taking to heaven? Only what I did for Jesus Christ. My service for Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going with me. That's it. You better not fall for the sin of pride. You better not care what other people think of you in this life. You better set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. 
Because if you're only thinking about what's going on down here and you're worried what people think about you, worried about what people think about your house, is it big enough? Worried about your vehicle, is it new enough? Worried about your clothes, are they stylish enough? Worried about whatever, your career, whatever else. You're off the mark. I can tell you that. You're off from where the Lord wants you to be. Do not fall for the sin of pride. That's going to be it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, Lord, and I thank you uh, for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord, that, that we can truly say that we are saved and that we know we're saved, um, not because we have pride, Lord, but because of the fact that we have humbled ourselves and come to you as sinners and put our faith in your shed blood on the cross, your death, burial, and resurrection, and the fact that we have your word, Lord, that we can know about all these things, that we can be warned about the pride of life and the things down here that entangle men and that, and that draw them in and cause them to get away from earning rewards in heaven. And I pray, Lord, for the viewers out there that they would not uh, succumb to these things, Lord, but they, would, they, would, they wouldn't care about what the world thinks of them. I just pray, Lord, that they would think about setting their affections on things above and not on things on this earth. And I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, two quick ministry little announcements here. First of all, I want to thank everybody for praying for the uh, young Catholic woman that I mentioned. Well, former Catholic. Um, real amazing answer to prayer. Uh, I actually was contacted by her in the, in the past week here. Her mother has accepted the Lord. So, praise the Lord for that. Uh, another soul on their way to heaven. Uh, just, I'm just so happy about it. Just filled with joy. I just, wow. And uh, so there's two people that are on their way to heaven that previously were not. And I thank all my viewers out there, everybody that uh, was praying. Thank you. Prayer does work. Prayer changes things. So uh, that one. And the second announcement, uh, we have been working, my wife over there and myself, we have been working now on uh, this study about um, where did Baptist church buildings come from. Uh, I know some of you are getting sick and tired of me ripping on buildings all the time, but we found some things, brothers and sisters, that you aren't going to believe. Um, some very, very wild information. Uh, I just, I'm quite shocked by some of it, to be very honest with you, some of the history of these, uh, of the Baptist system. Um, and before you get all excited out there, if you're an independent fundamental Baptist, um, doctrinally, mostly I am the same way, but I don't call myself a Baptist simply because it's a label. I don't really see any labels in, in Scripture. And so I'm just a King James Bible-believing Christian. That's all I am. Sinner saved by grace. That's, that's me. But uh, I'm not coming out and attacking Baptists, singling them out as this wretched apostate organization. I'm simply saying that doctrinally you might be all right, but in practice there are some very, very serious errors. Very serious. And I'm going to be saying some things that are going to shock a lot of you, okay, in this study. Um, right now, just to show you here, this is my sermon notes for this week's sermon. It's two pages, you know, two pages. This study that we have with all the documentation, all the photographs, all the uh, links to websites. I'm actually going to have a PDF for this sermon. One of the first ones I've ever done. I've, I have a couple that I have PDFs for, but this one's going to have a PDF file. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm documenting what I'm saying, in other words. It's not going to be just my attitude, rant and raving for a long time. But this PDF is 27 pages right now. So it's a very, very, very detailed study. I mean, my wife and I both have been working on this. She's actually been working on it longer than I have, documenting things. I tell her, please look this up, please look that up. God's blessed me with a wife that can do that type of work, research for me. Um, so I, I praise the Lord for her for that. But this information is earth-shattering, okay? Some of the stuff we found out. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to spoil it, but it's crazy. So we're going to be bringing this study out. Uh, we were going to record it today, but it's been 
raining off and on. I see the sun's out again, and it's probably going to get dark and rain some more. But uh, hopefully, Lord willing, tomorrow um, we'll be able to record this thing, and I'm going to have to put a lot of text and pictures in, in it and everything else. So it should be out in the next week or two. It's going to be the first part, and there's going to be another part coming up after that. I'll talk more about that when we get into the study, but it's a big, 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 big issue. Very big issue. Probably one of the most important things I've ever talked about. And uh, so look for that. And uh, please pray for us with this whole thing, too, because we are... Uh, another reason I'm saying that this is a very big study is because we have experienced more spiritual warfare with our research for this thing than anything I've ever done in the past. Uh, it's incredible. I got very, very violently ill the one time, and I mean, it was just, <laughs> it's been rough. So I don't imagine the devil's going to be real happy when this information comes out. And uh, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of warfare issues between now and the time that it's released on YouTube. So um, please pray for us. Pray that the Lord protects us as we do this study, and uh, we'll get this thing out. So that's going to be it for today. Thank you very much for watching this video. And I pray that you can get pride out of your life. And even out of your vocabulary, like I said at the beginning of this video. Don't be going around saying, I sure am proud of this or I'm proud of that. I am well pleased with this. Your son does something good. Your daughter, your wife does something good. Your husband does something You say, I'm really well pleased with you. Okay, get rid of that word pride out of your vocabulary. Alright, thank you for watching.